and welcome to the kickoff for the Freedom to Read Foundation's 45th anniversary celebration. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us. My name is Jonathan Kelly. I'm the program officer at the Freedom to Read Foundation, and I'm pleased to be the person to introdu introduce today's events. The Freedom to Read Foundation began as the brainchild of uh, several America, of America Library Association members, leaders, and staff who were concerned that too often librarians and uh, who collected material that was controversial did not feel they had the support of their colleagues or a clear mechanism for defending themselves in court should they find themselves there. FTRF was established to put principles into practice and in the intervening 45 years this organization has done some really important work via grants, litigation, and public education to ensure that librarians and libraries feel secure in their right to collect I don't know what happened. <laughs> ah, I see. Sorry about that. Uh, FTRF also supports the First Amendment rights of journalists, students, publishers, booksellers, and others, and we participate in litigation when these rights are threatened. Over the coming 12 months, we'll be celebrating the ongoing work of the Freedom to Read Foundation in events in locations around the country. I'll mention a few of them at the end of this time. Uh, and before I introduce our first speaker today, I want to give a quick pitch for Freedom to Read Foundation membership. FTRF is supported primarily through individuals and organizations who give $35, $50, $100 for students $10 or more per year to be a part of this vital organization. If you're not currently a member, we ask that you please consider joining and making the Freedom to Read Foundation a cause you commit to with your pocketbook as well as with your time and your attention. To join please visit www.ftrf.org. There's a link on our homepage for joining. And now I'm happy to introduce our first speaker. Barbara Jones is the Freedom to Read Foundation's Executive Director and Secretary. She also serves as the Director of the American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom. She's the second person ever to hold these positions, the first being the founding Executive Director, Judith Krug, a name familiar to many of you. Barbara, please take it away. Thanks, Jonathan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the kickoff of a very exciting year for the Freedom to Read Foundation. Forty-five years ago today, the Articles of Incorporation were filed in Illinois for what is today a $1 million endowed organization with 1,500 loyal members. Remember, we are the only foundation of its kind that defends and promotes the freedom to read in the courts, in our schools, in our libraries. This year we are celebrating 45 years with a series of events as Jonathan mentioned. They are around the country from a play to readouts to a non-gala gala. Please join us as Jonathan mentioned and I will mention again go to www.ftrf.org. We need you and want you. There will be increasing numbers of activities for you to do at the local level and so we would love for you to join and get you started. Today features some important guests, one of whom has been banned and is proud of it. So I hand it over to Chris Crutcher, banned author. Chris, take it away. Oh, thank you and it's it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I think the first time the first time I recognized that I was being banned, um, I got a copy of USA Today, and I found myself on a list, and it was it was back in like 1980. Um, oh, 80. It must have been 84. Uh, my book, my first book, had been out uh, about a year, and I found myself on a list in, in, in USA Today with Kurt Vonnegut and Mark Twain and Robert Cormier and Judy Bloom. And uh, there was a little blue panel next to the article, and it had the list of books that were the most banned for that year. And I was the only unknown author there. And I, I think I spent at least one full royalty payment on copies of USA Today. So I, I went out and I, and I cut them all out, and then I, I uh, laminated them and sent them out to my friends as bookmarkers. So my history of being banned is uh, it goes back a ways. What, what's always been really interesting to me is, is who bans me? 
once in a while I'll get banned by the politically correct left because my my racist characters use racial language and my desperate characters use desperate language and so there will be some a little bit of kickback there but about 95 percent of the time I get I get banned or challenged at least by the Christian right or the conservative right and when I when I hear them call themselves the conservative right it's, it's always an interesting thing to me my father was by the time my dad was the same age I was when I graduated from college he had flown 35 missions as pilot of a B-17 over Germany out of England and my dad was a patriot I mean he came back to he came back to Valley County Idaho and if you were running from anything from dog catcher to president of the United States my old man was your campaign manager if you lived in you're out of Valley County and my dad would have run a nail through his eye before he let a book get banned he thought he fought a war for that and there was an entire there was an entire um, Uh, an entire philosophy that was considered conservative that was about these freedoms the freedom to read the freedom to have you know rights women's rights over their own bodies I mean all of the all of the a lot of the kinds of things that we that we fight uh, that I as a flaming liberal fight with the conservatives all the time would not have been things that I would have been fighting I was raised on that in a conservative household so it's always a little bit strange to me when when um, those are the people who are coming after me, and I look at the I look at this at the situation and I, I, I at the at the uh, at this the whole idea of banning books and challenging books, which is basically the idea of mind control. The belief is that if I can control what goes on in your head, I can control what you think. I can control how you act, and that's I mean number one, it's ludicrous. It can't be done, but I, I look at it kind of in, uh, from two perspectives and part of that is because I spent so many years working as a therapist with families that were in, in horrible conditions, child abuse families, people who had drug involved families, I mean you name the, uh, the, the maladies um, and it was my job to stick my nose in, you know, in their business. And one of the things that you would see over and over and over again between the older generation and the younger generation was this idea from the older generation that if I can control what goes on in my kid's head then there's a chance that I can control my kid and it never worked so there are these there are these two kind of ways I look at it one one is the philosophical uh, the philosophical perspective and basically that that one's easy I mean I love to have that argument because I'm with I can use three of my IQ points and I don't have a lot but I can use three of my IQ points and win that argument. I mean, basically, if you're a teacher, if you're working a lot, I mean, if you're anywhere where where information is handed down to kids from us as adults, um, if if you're the parent of that kid, you have the right to tell that kid he can't read the book. Now, good luck with that. But you have you have the right to have some control over what happens in your own family. You do not have the right to say that about other people's kids. You do not have the right to say, I don't want my kid reading that book and I don't want anybody else's kids reading that book either. And like I say, that's an easy argument because I mean that you know that that flies in the face of individual freedoms across the board. So that argument's not a big deal. The second argument for me though is a personal one because having worked in the world of child abuse and neglect and having worked not so much the, the fact that it's about child abuse and neglect but the fact that it's about relationship and that it's about how, how, how younger folks get along with older folks and how we communicate with each other and I mean we live in a culture where we're terrified of adults and, and most of my writing if you if you don't know my writing most of my writing is about teenagers and adolescence is a time of it's a time of, of great conflict and it's a time when we're supposed to be as kids we're supposed to be pushing against our parents we're not supposed to be doing if we're developing correctly we're not supposed to be doing what our parents want us to do just because they say so and and when it when it comes to 
the exchange of information. In other words, this this idea that I mean, parents come into this place where they want to control what what their kids think. They want to con I mean, first, I mean, they want to control their behavior, but to do that, you have to control what they think, and that's when we get into the place of what can you read, what what you know, what can we make available. I can't tell you the number of times that a kid has said to me, my parents absolutely do not understand me. They don't speak my language. They don't want to listen to me when I get angry. They don't want to see the world through my eyes. Well, I get it. I mean, I can understand that, you know, most of us as, as adults, when we get in that place, we've already seen the world through those eyes and it wasn't all that great. But what we do have the what we do have the capacity to do as adults with good stories is put stories in the hands of kids that those kids can relate to. We can I can't tell you the number of times that a kid has written an email to me that said, How did you know what I was thinking? When in fact I didn't know what they were thinking. But I do know about kids and I do know about adolescents. Lori Hulse Anderson could could, she could lay emails end to end from my house to any one of your houses of letters that she's gotten back on speak from girls who said, I didn't even know it was rape. I didn't even know it wasn't my fault until I read your story. I picked up a book and I was able to find out that somebody else in the world knew what my life was like. And when somebody else in the world knows what my life is like, I feel better. I feel release and I feel relief and I feel empowered and when I, when I feel empowered I have a chance to you know I have a chance to make my life work. So much of education, so much of handing stories to the next generation is about empowerment and we have the, I, as librarians, as as teachers, as just any adult that wants to lend a hand back, we may feel that we're not in, you know, we're not capable in, in a lot of situations of making that connection with kids. We can always make that connection through story. We can, if we pick the right story and we pick the right kid, we can make that connection. And the playing field is leveled at that point. The playing field is level because now we can both talk about that story. We don't have to tell each other about our own lives. We can talk about the lives of that character. And we can learn about each other in, in a way that in, avoids a lot of the embarrassment that goes on between, between adults and kids when we're, when, we're, when we're having those conversations. One of the things I love about the American Libraries Association's picture to this, or uh, uh, take on this, and I'll, I'll wrap this up, is that it's really easy to ban things in schools. The American Library Association and the Freedom to Read folks are, are pretty hard to, to censor. I mean, public libraries are real hard to get, I mean, you get a lot of challenges, you get less censorship. And if anybody, I have a policy, if somebody bans, if, if a school bans my books and they do it all the time, I send five copies of that book to the nearest public library and I write the newspaper to say I did it. Because one of the things that I know that's going to happen in that library is that that librarian most of the time is going to be willing to put that, that story into the hands of the kids that need it. So that's my, that's my take on, on freedom of expression, the right to read, and the right to put stuff out there to read. And remember one thing, you ban one book, every other book in the, every other book in Every other book is in the crosshairs. So thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. And anybody out there who, for some reason, hasn't read any of his books, it's Chris Crutcher, and they're not just for young adults. Um, adults will get a great deal to think about in his books, too. Very thoughtful books uh, based on years of experience as a counselor and as an author who really understands young people. So, Chris, um, on behalf of the Freedom to Read Foundation, I want to thank you for your years of devotion to the foundation and to our many activities. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> okay, next, I want to talk about um, 
Teresa Chimera, and she has been our legal counsel at the Freedom to Read Foundation. She's worked with the foundation for 25 years. It does not seem possible, Teresa, but we've worked together for a, a long time, and I'm going to hand it over to Teresa so she can tell you about more about the foundation. Teresa, take it over. Okay, hello. Um, I'm really delighted to be here today. I don't know if everyone can see the um, the PowerPoint. Is it everyone seeing that? Of course, it's very difficult um, in just a few minutes to summarize the um, 45 years of litigation matters that um, Freedom to Read Foundation has been involved with. Um, but what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about the types of cases that FTRF has been involved in and the types of ways that the foundation gets involved. There are several ways that the foundation becomes involved. Um, often it can be as a plaintiff. In this case, the um, Freedom to Read Foundation joins the litigation with other First Amendment groups, other plaintiffs, in a direct challenge that to a federal or state statute alleging that there's a direct harm to a member of the foundation. Um, in other cases, a Freedom to Read Foundation joins a brief that may be written in support of one party that provides the court really with another perspective on intellectual freedom issues and the impact that a ruling in that particular case might have on other free speech issues, on libraries, on the ability to access information. As I think Jonathan already mentioned, um, sometimes uh, Freedom to Read Foundation provides grants. It may be a litigation matter that it isn't at an appropriate stage, an appellate stage for an amicus brief, and not one that Freedom to Read could join as a plaintiff, but Freedom to Read can assist a plaintiff by providing a grant and allowing them to um, hire their own counsel. And sometimes uh, the foundation is also asked to provide expert assistance, so they might be able to pinpoint someone that could serve as an expert in a particular case. In terms of the types of cases, it, there is no way to really summarize every case that the foundation has been involved with, but the Freedom Foundation has a history page that can do that for you. And today I just wanted to talk about some different areas. For example, censorship. Um, the foundation has been involved for many, many years in different censorship cases, such as the seminal case of Board of Education v. Pico, which presented a challenge to removal of books from a school library. Um, in that case, the foundation joined as an amicus, emphasizing to the court the importance of finding that the First Amendment doesn't just include the right to speak, but includes the right to receive information, and that the minors in a school library have that right to receive information that is in the library and that school boards and school officials cannot censor materials simply based on their own views because they disagree with a political viewpoint, a personal viewpoint, or otherwise disagree with the content of a book. And the Supreme Court accepted that view, that there is the right to receive information and that you, you can't m remove materials just because you disagree with them. There would have to be some finding that they're educationally unsuitable or otherwise pervasively vulgar making them unsuitable for the education. Uh, of the uh, students in that particular um, school. And in that case, that requires expert opinions. It's not a school board member saying, well, I disagree with that you know, viewpoint. It's an expert saying, this is a book that is suitable for, the, um, for students to have in a library. Other cases that Freedom to Read has been involved with are simply access to the library itself. You know, the issue of when can patrons have access to all the materials there or, or what rules and library policies can libraries have. In a case in rising out of New Jersey, Crimer v. Morristown, for example, there was a challenge to patron behavior uh, rules in the public library where a patron had his, had his privileges um, revoked. Freedom Reed was able to join an amicus brief that outlined for the Third Circuit 
the importance of having library policies, but the importance of those policies being objective and taking into account the right to receive information while allowing libraries to draft reasonable and content neutral policies that would further the mission of providing access to everyone. So certainly libraries need to have time, place, and manner rules about how long you can use um, an internet terminal or the fact that you can't be running through the library um, playing music at you know top decibel levels when disrupting everyone else who is using the library. Those are reasonable content neutral time, place, and manner rules and those are policies that libraries need to have in order to fulfill their mission of serving the community but those rules need to account for providing the greatest access through under the First Amendment for the community to be able to access materials that are in the library. Another area that Freedom to Read Foundation has been involved with are the confidentiality of patron records. Um, there have been instances where uh, governmental ent entities, law enforcement, sometimes um, citizens involved in litigation matters will go to a library and try to subpoena the records of patrons and Freedom to Read has um, been a supporter of the privacy of those records. It's not absolute, it doesn't mean that the patron records can never be turned over but that there has to be under the First Amendment a balancing test. Uh, Kramer Books was a case that arose in the context of bookstore customer records. There was a challenge to a law enforcement re subpoena request of a customer's records and uh, Freedom to Read joined an amicus in that case and in many other cases that emphasize the importance of considering First Amendment concerns of subpoena requests that make broad requests and argued that there needed to be a balancing and there needed to be a showing by law enforcement that there was a compelling interest in getting the information, that there needed to be a narrow tailoring of the request to just get the information that was needed. So you couldn't have broad requests that asked for everyone who had read a certain book or who had borrowed books about a certain topic, that it had to be really narrowed and that law enforcement needed to show that there was no alternative method to secure the information that they needed. In other areas, Freedom to Read becomes involved in protecting speech and protecting librarians. Um, for example, I mentioned earlier that a Freedom to Read Foundation often joins cases as a plaintiff. Many of those arise where state criminal statutes restrict, restrict speech and they do so with vague and overbroad language that could chill a significant amount of speech and perhaps subject librarians to criminal prosecutions. Um, in fact, Freedom to Read Foundation currently is a plaintiff in such a case. There is a challenge in Arizona to a statute that bans materials um, that contain nudity without the consent of the person in the photo. Um, Freedom to Read Foundation joined as a plaintiff with a broad coalition of uh, bookstores um, and other groups arguing that the statute is unconstitutional. While the statute had been posited as a, a, a revenge porn statute, which is generally understood as revenge porn is understood as someone you know, in a personal relationship, take having photos of someone that they're in a relationship with, and when the relationship doesn't work out, they post those photos. This statute goes well, well, well beyond that. It really is not about uh, trying to cure the problem and provide resources for people who are the subject of revenge porn. It um, is not at all narrow in that sense. The language is so broad that it could reach artistic books, educational materials, historical materials, medical images that are fully protected by the First Amendment, which have nothing to do with revenge porn, and for which librarians couldn't possibly ascertain original consent or secure current consent. There might be art books that, um, that and we know that libraries in Arizona and outside of Arizona have materials um, that contain these images that are fully protected by the First Amendment, again, have nothing to do with revenge porn. Um, and the folks in those art photos it surely gave consent at the time, but they can't give consent now. And under this law, 
you would have to have current consent for the particular borrowing of the materials at the moment. And the statute imposes a penalty of almost four years in prison if convicted. So librarians are faced with the possibility that they might possibly be prosecuted. Um, the law is written so broadly. The online public access catalogs of Arizona libraries that would be accessed outside of Arizona that simply offer an art book, even if that image is not in the catalog, could be subject to this law. So again, librarians are faced um, with a choice. Do they chill speech so they can't possibly be prosecuted? Do they take the risk of being prosecuted um, and a possible conviction? And even if during a prosecution they could raise the defenses of the First Amendment, you, we don't want librarians to face that prosecution, the ordeal of having to go through that. So this was an important case for Freedom to Read Foundation to join and again is Freedom to Read Foundation currently is a plaintiff in that case. Another area where the foundation joins um, cases and becomes involved is protecting minor speech rights. Going back to the first case, um, Board of Education v. Pico, through many cases um, through the years, Freedom to Read Foundation has joined in cases as a plaintiff and as an amicus where the rights of minors to, to speak and to receive information um, is being restricted unconstitutionally. A current case where the Freedom to Read Foundation is involved as an amicus is a case that arose again in Arizona um, involving the Tucson School District. Um, Freedom to Read Foundation recently coordinated the drafting and filing of an amicus in the Ninth Circuit, which is where the case currently is, and it challenges the Arizona statute that was used to eliminate the Mexican-American Studies program in the Tucson School District. By way of background, um, what the statute um, prohibits is school districts from having any courses or classes that one, could promote the overthrow of the United States government, two, could promote resentment toward a race or class of people, three, are designed primarily for pupils of a particular ethnic group, or advocate ethnic solidarity instead of the treatment of pupils as individuals. This, of course, is very broad language, very vague language, and it would be very hard for school officials, teachers, administrators, school districts in Arizona to know what might be targeted as violating this statute. But the consequences are great. If you have a course and a curriculum that has materials that the someone might say, um, the state education um, officials might say violate this statute, you could lose 10% uh, of monthly of your state aid. That's a, a huge consequence, which means that, again, as school officials or and, and teachers are trying to put together courses and, and their curriculum and making decisions about spending and training of teachers and preparing of materials, they face the prospect that, well, you know, what if down the road someone finds that this violates that statute and we lose our funding, we lose all that we've contributed to putting together this course. Again, a chill on speech because teachers will have to, to you know, keep that in mind and school districts will have to keep that in mind, particularly since there was a Mexican-American Studies program that was eliminated under this statute. The amicus that Freedom to Read um, drafted and, and which was joined by other co broad coalition of other groups provides the court with examples of precisely these types of materials that educators might be concerned about using given the broad language of the statute. And for more information about any of these things, as I've mentioned, um, there is a history page on the Freedom to Read Foundation website that provides explanations of the different cases over the 45 years that the foundation has been involved with. Um, with respect to this Tucson case, there's a page specifically about this case that uh, would provide you the opportunity to read the amicus, the Freedom to Read coordinated, as well as the other briefs and other amicus briefs that were filed in this case. And with respect to the current Arizona case that Freedom to Read Foundation has joined, um, there's, uh, there are in, there's information on the website 
uh, including uh, materials from the case and a fact sheet that explains the um, important facts about the case. So that's just a little bit, um, a little bit of time there to to go over the 45 years of the many, many cases in different areas in which the foundation has been involved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. I want to just say to everybody that Teresa uh, is the legal counsel, and for a lot of us who aren't attorneys, her um, advice and explanations at every single board meeting at all of ALA are just amazing. And people come to the meetings in the, on those mornings just to hear Teresa summarize all the court cases and explain them to us in the room who aren't attorneys. This by itself is worth the membership to Freedom to Read for many, many people. So um, I applaud you, Teresa, for all your work for us all these years. And as she mentioned, fact sheets to explain why we've taken on certain cases. Because some of what we do is pretty controversial. And we can help you. If you're in the midst of one of these controversies, we can help you explain the law to your boards or we can help with explaining why a particular issue has, has certain policies and laws. So again, thank you and I will now turn to Emily Knox. Most of the work that Freedom to Read has done for over the years has been to defend the freedom to read which is a great thing and now we are beginning more and more to reach out and educate the general public and students about what the First Amendment is, how it applies to libraries and Emily Knox from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has taught the first online credit course and Emily, I'm going to turn it over to you to explain more. Hi, thanks for introducing me. My name is Emily Knox. I am an assistant professor at the Graduate School of Library and Information Science at University of Illinois. Uh, I taught the first um, joint collaboration with the Freedom to Read Foundation um, and my intellectual freedom class. Um, this is part of the Judith Krug Memorial Fund, which was named for Judith Krug, the founding executive director of the Freedom to Read Foundation and the founding director of American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom, as you heard earlier. Um, the Memorial Fund supports two initiatives. First, Banned Books Week um, event grants. And last year, seven organizations won. And you can find out more on the website to uh, hear a little bit more about what those organizations did with their grants. And also, the grant, um, the fund uh, supports intellectual freedom online education. So the fund collaborated with Gisless uh, for this first class. It was an online synchronous class, which means that we all get on the computer on the same at the same time on the same day, um, and basically uh, we're able to chat to each other, to talk through the um, microphones. I generally give a short lecture on our topic, and then we have discussion. The students also go into small group discussion on anything that we discuss. Um, the Freedom to Read Foundation provided two scholarships for students to attend the class, uh, and each student received a copy of the ALA published book, True Stories of Censorship Battles in America's Libraries. Um, the other thing that the uh, Freedom to Read Foundation helped with quite a bit was uh, the finding speakers. Each week, um, the class would start by hearing someone's own experience with dealing with a challenge or uh, talking about the work of the Freedom to Read Foundation. Uh, some of our speakers included Valerie Nye, James LaRue, and Dee Venuto. Um, it was a wonderful experience for the students to hear from people who had actually gone through <clears throat> um, a particular uh, censorship battle of their own. Many of the people who had actually um, 
written for the uh, for the book that I mentioned earlier, True Stories. Um, but they were able to ask them questions to find out, you know, how they could put what they're learning in this class into practice once they become uh, librarians and information professionals. Um, it was a wonderful, wonderful enhancement uh, to the class overall. So I'll tell you a little bit more about what we discussed in the class. Uh, there were it was an eight week class. It's a half semester class, um, but taken for two credits. So that's uh, pretty typical. Um, we start by just a general introduction, and then we move on to historical roots of intellectual freedom. So there, the students read uh, some of the work of Judith Krug, and also they read uh, John Stuart Mill's. Um, on liberty. Uh, we discussed intellectual freedom and the information professions and in that one we read through all the code of ethics, the codes of ethics, so not only for ALA but also for ACIST and really start to think about how do we put these ethical ideas into practice. Um, then we move to more specific topics and those topics include uh, pro and anti-censorship arguments, uh, free speech and hate speech, which is always an interesting one. Um, how do we understand and define those, those um, ideas? Uh, access and privacy. This, of course, has become even more important in the wake of um, the revelations from Snowden. And then we go from talking about uh, these specific topics into putting what we've learned into practice. So I am very, uh, I talk a lot about policy and how do we um, use policy to uh, navigate the waters of a censorship um, battle or um, whenever you might have a challenge case in your own um, uh, institution. And we talk about how policy works, that we need to review policy on a regular basis, how to put the code of ethics into policy, and also, of course, the Library Bill of Rights. Um, and then we talk about uh, discussing uh, handling challenge cases on a one-to-one -one basis with patrons. So we um, talk about if someone comes up to the desk and says that they're upset about a particular book, how do we handle that? Um, if it goes on to, uh, say, move up the ladder to your uh, director, what do we do then? If it's a hearing, what do you do after that? Um, so this is really the more practical part of the class overall. And we also just discuss banned books. So a lot of students are, and myself, were really interested in banned books, and so we just talk about our favorite banned books. We talk about why people ban books. Um, and so that kind of wraps up a lot of the class. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the assignments that the students do. So one of their first assignments is where they actually look at um, various organizations that are involved in um, fights for intellectual freedom. So Freedom to Read Foundation is one of those organizations, and students talk about what uh, the Freedom to Read Foundation could do to support them and other information professionals when they're in the workplace. Uh, one of their other projects, um, and this is actually the final project, is they basically build a portfolio that responds to a scenario that I've written out um, of a challenge case in a different type, different types of libraries. So at the moment, the libraries are um, in a public library, in youth services, um, in a school library, and in, a, in an ac academic library. And as part of this project, what they have to do is write a letter to the uh, um, patron um, saying that they have heard their complaint and what their decision will be on that complaint. They also have to write a letter to the board, so whatever that board might be, um, so either the school board or the library board, talking about the challenge itself and um, giving their recommendations for responding to that challenge. Uh, they also have to su provide support in the form of usually reviews or anything else that they have read about a particular book that's been challenged. Um, then they have to write a communications plan. So that's an important part of being involved in a challenge case is how are you going to talk to your public? And I insist in that particular um, uh, 
a part of the portfolio that they talk about all the different publics. So who is your audience? Your audience could be the kids who come to the library. It could be, um, it's also um, their parents. It's also other patrons who come to the library. It's the community at large. Um, it could be your board of directors because they might not be on the same page as you. Um, the mayor, uh, the media, as well. So there are all sorts of different audiences that they need to address in this communications plan. And then finally, uh, they write a reflection paper. And that's actually one of my favorite parts to read of this particular project because the students get very involved in talking about um, how they felt while they were writing this particular letter, what it was like to come up with the communication plan. Um, it becomes sort of a, um, I would say like a, a method acting exercise for them where they become very invested in making sure that um, they are responding in the right way and uh, and communicating the uh, the uh, um, our, our uh, ideas about intellectual freedom to people who might not know where we come from and how do you put this into language that everybody understands. Um, I actually should mention that this year I had a student who was actually going through a challenge case while we were in class and she was able to do her project on her actual case. So I really told her that was absolutely fine um, and she went through everything and she uh, you know, showed me some of the responses that she had and it was just wonderful that it really uh, met up with, let's just say, real life at the same time during the class. So um, this has been a wonderful support, a wonderful collaboration um, with the Freedom to Read Foundation. Uh, we're hoping to do it again in the coming school year uh, just to um, make sure that uh, we are able to have people understand how um, actually really train information professionals to be aware of these topics and to be able to have really good responses to people who are trying to ban books or other materials in, um, in their institutions. Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, I want to take the course. Doesn't it sound exciting? For those of us who have been in the field for a while, I'm particularly delighted. I mean, I suppose the student wasn't so delighted, but uh, the fact that uh, the student had a chance to talk about the case in a particular library and to apply it so directly with uh, being the values of the freedom to read and how to actually put values into action. What a, a really terrific educational experience. We are looking forward to continuing our collaboration with Emily and with the University of Illinois, which is ranked the number one library school in the country right now. And so stay tuned, there will be more. And we do plan to try other kinds of technology and other kinds of ways to reach students, the general public, and people who have an interest in the issues of the freedom to read and how to uh, support in their community an environment, a platform, if you will, for the freedom to read. So thanks again, Emily. It's a, a great collaboration. So now I'm going to turn the program over back to Jonathan Kelly, who, by the way, is responsible for putting together this program, and I want to thank you publicly, Jonathan, for that and for many of the programs that are going to come. He's worked for the Freedom to Read Foundation for 15 years now, and he will tell you about some of the programming that you can expect in the year to come. Jonathan, over to you. Thanks, Barbara, um, and thanks to all the speakers. It was really terrific to hear from you and very exciting um, to hear about the work that is being implemented by the, the Freedom to Read Foundation. It's really been my pleasure to work with this organization for a decade and a half now. I have uh, uh, um, 
learned quite a lot and uh, it, it's exciting to be able to help present programs such as this and some of the other ones that we'll be doing in the coming years, uh, in the coming months. And I'd like to talk some uh, about our next two programs uh, specifically that are going to be part of this 45th anniversary celebration. The first one is a really exciting collaboration and I'm going to try to bring it up on my screen while we do this. Um, it's a collaboration with the Pioneer Theater Company, uh, which is based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, hopefully you can see this. It's uh, called Alabama Story. We were approached by the playwright Kenneth Jones um, about this world premiere production that's going on in, um, in ja starting in, Jan in January in Salt Lake City. It's a story of a librarian in Alabama in the late 50s named Emily Wheelock Reed. Uh, Ms. Reed uh, was challenged at the time in her position as state librarian because she collected books uh, uh, and encouraged libraries in the state, public libraries in the state, to carry books um, that state legislators uh, one, per, one particular state legislator, but other um, white supremacist and segregationist newsletters, uh, newspapers, I'm found to be in violation of the the state uh, sanctioned segregation of the time. She stood up against uh, her opponents and um, successfully kept the books on the shelves. It looks like you can't see it. But if you go to pioneertheater.org, uh, you'll be able to see that they'll be uh, running the show um, in January. And the Freedom to Read Foundation on January 17th is going to be, uh, let's see, I'm going to unshare this, is going to be hosting an event. Uh, it coincides with the very first, the 45th anniversary of the very first board meeting of the Freedom to Read Foundation. So that's going to be really exciting and we'll be putting something up on that on our website in the next couple of weeks. Our second event is going to be also in January. On January 31st, we're pleased uh, in conjunction with ALA's Midwinter Meeting in Chicago to present an author event of Bone, Jeff Smith, one of the uh, frequently challenged, uh, he's appeared on the top ALA's top 10 most frequently challenged books in recent years. Uh, that'll be on the evening of January 31st and again we will be having, uh, will be, it'll be a fundraiser for the foundation. So uh, for those of you who will be in Chicago or the Chicago area or attending the midwinter meeting, uh, we hope that you can attend that. We'll be posting the uh, event plans on that uh, again within the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have events also planned for Portland in March uh, in conjunction with the ACRL National Conference, the Association of College and Research Libraries, and then in April in Austin, Texas in conjunction with the Texas Library Association Conference. And these events are going to be open to the public, so even if you're not there for a particular conference, uh, but you are around, you can still attend. Um, in San Francisco in June is ALA's annual conference. We'll be doing an event there as well. Um, and annual conferences where one of FTRF's projects, uh, the Conable Scholarship, uh, takes place. Basically, uh, library school students and recent graduates are invited to apply for a conference scholarship and uh, funds raised in the memory of one of FTRF's true heroes, uh, Gordon Conable, who passed away several years ago, have uh, now funded, I believe, six uh, con uh, future and now current leaders um, in librarianship who have taken the mantle of, uh, who, have who have come to these conferences um, on the, paid for by these funds and have uh, over the years really become leaders in their own right in uh, the world of intellectual freedom. And then in the fall we'll be uh, again celebrating Banned Books Week. Uh, as Emily mentioned, through the Judith Krug Fund, Banned Books Week uh, grants are given by the Freedom to Read Foundation um, and have led to some really amazing, um, fun, inventive programs by local libraries, colleges, schools, community organizations. There have been dance performances, there have been theatrical performances, uh, there have been online exhibits, um, 
so many unique ways to bring communities together to talk about issues of censorship and most importantly celebrate the freedom to read. Uh, it's too easy sometimes to take it for granted um, and so Banned Books Week provides a very unique opportunity uh, to really engage in dialogue across across uh, boundaries that we may have on our shared um, our shared value of access to information and the freedom to read. We will be opening those grants up in the spring, so keep an eye on that. Um, how how can you be involved? Well, certainly attending these events and and sharing the word with your friends and colleagues is super important. You know, following us on social media is. Uh, very easy. We are just FTRF on Twitter, Freedom to Read on Facebook, and FTRF org on Google Plus. Um, go to our blog, which is on the front page of our website, FTRF.org, and um, become a member. Uh, as I mentioned at the top, almost all of our support comes from individuals and organizations who take it upon themselves to uh, stand up and uh, say I am a card carrying member of the Freedom to Read Foundation and yes we do actually send you a membership card every year. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, one other thing is that at the end of this 12 month period we're going to be having another online event that's going to be open to uh, everyone uh, and it's going to be a non-gala gala fundraiser. We'll send. We'll have more information on that uh, on our website in the coming months. And uh, we're also going to be doing a tribute book where people can trade a uh, collectible book where people can pay tribute to uh, some of the leaders of the Freedom to Read Foundation. Uh, we've mentioned Judith Krug and Gordon Conable, Alex Elaine, some people who uh, you may not know that much about Emily Reed, but uh, who was a founding member of the Freedom to Read Foundation but whose lives and legacies uh, can help live on in part through this book. So uh, that will be hopefully released by that published by uh, this time next year. So that's all I have to say. I want to thank everyone for joining us. It's been a great hour. Um, if you would like to comment on our YouTube uh, page, you're welcome to do so. Uh, and if you have questions for us, we can uh, respond on that page. I want to thank Teresa. Emily, Chris, and Barbara for giving their time today and helping make this uh, Google uh, Hangout a uh, success. And uh, look forward to sharing with you um, more of the Freedom to Read Foundation's uh, work, successes, and actions uh, in the 12 months. And one other thing, please remember that if you're going to be discussing any 45th anniversary activities on social media that we do have our hashtag FTRF45 uh, that will be in use for the next 12 months. Again, thanks so much everyone. Have a good one.